for the sake of time, we are starting our seminar today. Uh, that is going to be about advanced medical imaging technologies. Um, and we will be presenting several talks from the research laboratories of Boğaziçi University. Uh, this seminar is actually uh, a matchmaking session of Neurotech EU Neurico. And uh, we would like to understand the capacity that is available at Boğaziçi University in terms of medical imaging. And we hope that, you know, we could take this uh, synergy and then define several joint projects together in the future. Um, our first speaker will be Burak Ajar, and he would like to talk about past and current research on neuroimaging and neurosciences at Valve Lab. Uh, Burak Ajar, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be sharing my screen, and I hope you can see my screen, right? Right? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for attending our seminar. Uh, I'll be talking in a very, in a nutshell, actually, past and current research on neuroimaging and neurosciences at our lab at Boğaziçi University Electrical and Electronics Engineering Department. Uh, the overline, uh, the outline of the talk will be like uh, the, like this. Basically, I'll talk about research in non-neurosciences topics, just the topics which, in order to introduce our group to you. And then some diffusion imaging tractography, structural brain connectome embedding, and multimodal brain connectome decomposition. I'll, there will be a single slide on current focuses, focus uh, at the end of the presentation. So our research group and uh, actually works on medical imaging and signal processing in various fields in a diverse area, starting from ECG, electrocardiogram to CT colonoscopy, ultrasound simulations, biomechanical research, uh, liver diseases, case retrieval, com computer-aided annotation, and breast cancer susceptibility biomarkers. All of these are actually being run or was run in collaboration with groups from the Turkey or from, uh, from abroad, from other universities. Uh, act however, I will be mostly talking about the neurosciences and neurotechnology uh, projects in this, in this presentation. One of the topics that we did in the past uh, in collaboration with the Edith Epi University Hospital and Stanford University Medical School was uh, work on diffusion imaging and related tractography algorithms. One of, the, uh, one of the papers or the algorithms that we had proposed and published was the split and merge tractography. You can see the actual the citations at the bottom of these slides. The idea behind the split and merge tractography was actually to, to call to build the tractography by some means, by some tractography algorithm, and identify the unreliable parts of these tracks and split the tracks by from these unreliable parts and build a you know a huge number of reliable but short tracks. And then the split and, and the merging step comes in, and we try to estimate the probability of these short reliable tracks to be connected to each other. So it's somewhere between the probability probabilistic tractography and the uh, and the deterministic tractography uh, and it's it's it's kind of a reliability based interactive tractography algorithm and then uh, more recently actually we started working on brain connectomes and uh, we with the aim of uh, building connectomes and analyzing these connectomes, both from the structural and the technical, uh, for, both from the structural and the functional point of view. The overall pipeline is we start with the diffusion weighted MRI and the functional MRI, as well as the T1 weighted MRI, MR data. The diffusion weighted MRI gives us the tractography results. The par, uh, T1 gives us the parcellation of the cortical volumes and the functional MRI gives us the fun, uh, a correlation analysis between the atlas-based uh, parcellation of the cortical regions. And then these are used to build structural connectomes and functional connectomes, basically the network models, onto the same, uh, same basis, onto the same set of nodes. And this gives us a multimodal representation of the brain connectome. And that is used for further analysis. That multimodal representation of the brain connectome is used for further analysis. The, uh, the first publication that we had uh, using that uh, framework was the B-tensor uh, uh, paper, which was a tensor factorization of the brain connectome in a, a multimodal brain connectome for Alzheimer's diseases. Uh, using these, uh, using these connectomes, one uh, uh, master's thesis was completed on nodal embedding. And the idea here is that in a, in a nutshell, to use actual language models to, uh, to model the brain uh, network, because the languages are also modeled as uh, as graphs, 
The nodes in the languages are words and the links between the words in a language model are the co-occurrence probabilities of two words together. So that's basically a language model that is used in deep learning. So we actually took this, uh, took this model and applied it to the brain connectomes. In our case, we had the uh, nodes corresponding to the cortical regions and the relations between the cortical regions are actually the connectivities, structural or functional connectivities. So from that, uh, we built the language model and it's actually rather than getting into the detail of this because it's it's a little bit long but the idea is here uh, is this the individual connectomes are like individual languages so each brain is like an individual language each parcel cortical parcel is like a word in a language and uh, each corpus generates and we build a corpus from each uh, each language by using a deep walk uh, the random walk model so this is this is like Everybody has a, has its own language. Every brain is a is is a single language, but each all languages are using the same words because they use the same cortical regions. The only difference between language to language is the relation between the words, and so that's what we actually exploited. And by using this, we built uh, nodal embeddings uh, using deep learning uh, continuous bag of words models that, that are used in language models and used individual cortical embeddings to, to do classifications, AD versus SCI, AD versus MCI, MCI versus SCI. And uh, non surprisingly, uh, AD versus SCI uh, discrimination uh, is the best performing one, AD, MCI is the second performing one, and MCI, SCI is the third performing one, and different nodes are actually performing at different uh, at different levels. So we listed uh, some of the best performing nodes here for different classification tasks. And the B tensor is, as I told you, there is there are con uh, functional connectomes and structural connectomes networks. So if we put all these structural connectomes of a population of a cohort into a single uh, that data structure, it's a third dimensional, a third order tensor. If you put all the functional uh, connectomes into a, a data structure, it's another third order uh, tensor. If we put these two tensors together, it becomes a fourth order tensor, and that's the multimodal B tensor that brain tensor that we are using. So we actually applied decomposition, tensor decomposition on this. And the idea here is that we are trying to build a connectome, structural or functional connectome using some basis connectomes, some basis networks and with some linear coefficients. So we are trying to identify these basis networks that can be used in a linear uh, setup to build the empirically observed uh, connectome. So this representation, the linear representation that uh, we use to build the connectomes using the basis connectomes is actually a low dimensional representation of the uh, brain connectome, which is used uh, for classification or staging or any other purposes in this low dimensional space. So that's the paper in IEEE JBAH uh, published this year actually, uh, and uh, we have identified these are the these are the five networks basis networks actually we have identified linear combinations of these five basis networks uh, are shown to be able to build or approximate the empirically uh, observed structural and functional connectomes. And these basis connectomes actually agree with the existing neurological information pretty well because we are working with the neuroscience neurologists at this point and they have evaluated these, these mathematical results basically. And when using these five networks, actually we tried to use three bases, five bases, seven bases, up to 15 bases uh, networks at different dimensionalities. But the five basis network, five dimensional representation looks like pretty good actually. And we have achieved in our relatively small cohort, 100% uh, uh, separation uh, of, the, uh, of the groups, uh, three groups classification basically using functional uh, functional networks and using structural networks alone we achieved like up to like 91 percent accuracy and when we combined these two we actually achieved almost always with different combinations of structural and functional networks almost always 100 percent accuracy which shows that this five-dimensional representation is a meaningful representation 
So last slide, I hope I'm not over time. Uh, currently we are working on multi-scale brain connectome analysis. We are basically changing, uh, work, uh, studying the effects of changing connectome resolution using different uh, levels of parcellations of the cortical region. We are trying to learn to generate connectomes at higher resolutions from lower resolutions. There are actually recently published a couple of papers on that topic. Uh, and we are exploiting the use of multi-scale connectomes for diagnostics using multi-scale connectomes at the same time, basically. We, that's one line of research. The other line of research is structure function relationship. And here we are exploiting the graph signal processing. So we are you know, using the brain signals and the graph connectomes together uh, in a graph signal processing framework to uncover, to understand the structure function relation and how that, that how does that relation change at different stages of the disease, of a neurodegenerative disease. And geometric deep learning in multimodal connectomes is actually comes on top of all these things. So what we are trying to understand is how does neurodegenerative processes affect interplay between structure and function? What is the relation between changes in connectome and cognitive decline? And how can we monitor and predict disease progress? So thank you. Thank you for the brief but very nice presentation and thank you for being on time. Uh, next, I would like to give the floor to Professor Dr. Albert Güvenish. Uh, he will be talking about precision medicine group activities. Uh, Albert Hocam, the floor is yours. Okay, so I need to do sharing, right? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, I have the permission, so we can start, yes. So um, this talk is about precision medicine imaging, and that's what we do in our group. Okay. Yeah. Our group. Uh, Precision Medicine Imaging Group uh, deals with um, a number of issues uh, in imaging and medicine today that we will see now. Uh, now we see actually a, um, someone trying to open up a door uh, and uh, now let's ask this question, what, what is required to make this uh, effort really uh, much easier than normal. Uh, obviously, you want to have uh, high quality precision or high precision tools like the lock and the key, and also you need some light. Uh, what we need in medicine today is that we don't, uh, what we see is that we don't have enough light. We don't really see the mechanisms, the underlying mechanism very well, uh, and the tools are not extremely high precision. So this is what we are going to focus. And we can see here that the quality issues in medicine are actually quite big. There are about 250,000 to 440,000 people dying only in the United States due to quality issues. And this figure would make medical errors the cause of 10% of all US deaths and the third leading cause of death in the United States. So these are some of the numbers that we have. Uh, and if we continue with, uh, along this line, we'll see that also uh, we have some issues in clinical trials, such as 97% of clinical trials uh, for cancer drugs, for instance, fail. And the cause is usually that we don't know the mechanism so well, we rush into the trial uh, and unfortunately, we don't get good results. Uh, 15 to 20 percent of durable results with immunotherapy. This is another example of less of efficacy uh, of a drug. Uh, and if, even though we have some good results with such drugs, such as or therapies such as immunotherapy, we usually don't know what patients to select. Uh, before we start this therapy, because every patient is different and some patients uh, will uh, respond favorably and some will not. So we have to know in advance uh, how does this 
thing work and uh, which patients can really benefit from this uh, therapy before we start the therapy and lose basically time and also suffer many side effects for a therapy that will not be beneficial. So those are some of the things we face. Another uh, issue is the Alzheimer's drug trials uh, that have failed 99% of the time. So this is a very high failure rate, extremely high. And uh, so we, we are doing something which is not correct. And probably uh, this is, uh, you know, what we're not doing well is exactly why some guy is trying to open up the uh, the door and is not able to do it fast enough because uh, there is not enough light um, in the apartment or um, some other issues such as the lock not being uh, very precisely made or something of that sort. Um, so if we look at why we have such big failure rates um, and if we compare the human errors versus system errors, uh, Edward Deming, who was the pioneer of the quality movement, um, especially after the Second World War in Japan, uh, he estimated that 94% of errors are due to a faulty system design and not human errors. So he explains in his book, The System of Profound Knowledge, uh, that fact. So based on this now, we are... Uh, you know, uh, we need to consider uh, what are those system errors and, and that is usually instrumentation, procedures, materials, personnel, and training management. Uh, now, we take the first two instrumentation procedures, especially imaging instrumentation in our case, and more particularly molecular imaging systems such as PET-CT and uh, SPEC-CT and gamma cameras. So, uh, if we look at the instrumentation side, uh, we need to check the measurement uncertainties of diagnostic systems such as X-ray and improve them, and lack of precision in therapeutic systems such as radiotherapy. So all these things add up to the uh, failure rates, uh, just like you know, open up, opening up the key in a very uh, hostile environment. Uh, design issues and failures, that's another thing we need to check things like infusion pumps, which often uh, create uh, hazards. So quality engineering and metrology becomes uh, very essential in, in those uh, cases. Uh, precision medicine imaging focus, uh, that's our focus in our group. And so our goal is to improve the performance of molecular imaging and instrumentation and protocols using stochastic modeling and optimization improving efficacy uh, of therapeutic procedures by uh, non-invasive disease characterization using molecular imaging and statistical image processing techniques and prediction of therapy response success for each patient. So we we'll look at instrumentation precision example. Uh, we had a, some work that was done by a PhD student and uh, that was the design and evaluation of breast-specific collimator using response surface methodology and Monte Carlo simulation. We see this uh, publication here in uh, the article Transactions of Nuclear Science. And, uh, uh, you know, we obtained some good results, such as increasing uh, by 73% the contrast-to-noise ratio. So in, in a way, the detectability uh, of lesions that we see in uh, gamma cameras. So, uh, obviously, if the instrument cannot detect uh, uh, the lesions, uh, then uh, we're not talking about a very precise system and we make errors. So, uh, we use response surface methodology. We see some of the isoconflicts here uh, in trying to achieve. Uh, the optimum result. So, um, improvement of resolution by uh, up to four times in Monte Carlo study, that's another example that we have done, you know, in trying to improve resolution uh, in 
basically positioning algorithms for PEM imaging. Uh, we have other uh, examples. We have a book that we published that was for a uh, animal system. Um, and we have segmentation improved by 95 times less error. Well, uh, the title was Design and Evaluation of Accurate CNR Guided Contrast Noise Ratio Guided Small Region Iterative Restoration Based Tumor Segmentation Scheme for PET using both simulated and real heterogeneous tumors. So we have done that. That was an extensive work by another PhD student who achieved uh, substantial improvements in segmenting lesions for PET and that again helps in our uh, improving the efficacy of uh, the therapeutic uh, procedures. So that's another um, example, predictive biomarkers of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a very successful new therapy for cancer, uh, but the main problem with immunotherapies, it doesn't work always, not with every patient. So here we had a need to actually predict which patients would, um, which patients are likely to benefit from uh, immunotherapy because almost half of them don't uh, get any benefit and plus they have some side effects. So uh, that will be very important and we're able to predict that based on images, CT images. And this is another example here uh, of non-invasive prediction of uh, genetic mutation with a 94% accuracy. Again, uh, when you, uh, before you start your therapy, you want to know what are the genetic mutations that are, that are present in the tumor cells, and that would dictate the type of drug that you're going to use. Um, now we are trying to work uh, on the therapy response quantification uh, in a precise manner. So that would be also very important in assessing if any therapy works or doesn't work. Uh, and uh, so the current work right now is precision medicine techniques by the use of molecular imaging, PET or SPEC. And we are slowly moving from oncology to neurology. In other words, uh, basically, you can see more research now on neurology uh, using the techniques that were developed in oncology in terms of radiomics and um, radiogenomics, for instance. Um, all these techniques are basically thought in two courses. Um, one is on nuclear medicine instrumentation which involves PET and SPECT and molecular imaging. And the other course we give is qualifications for biomedical engineering, which also includes metrology uh, and all the tools that we can use to achieve those goals. So I thank you for listening. And this is the page where you can reach our group. You can send us email. And thank you again. Thank you, Alberto John, for the time presentation and being right on time. Thank uh, you. I would like to open the floor for questions because uh, I think Brokoja might be leaving soon. For our first two speakers, Brokoja and Albertoja, are there any questions from the audience? If so, please uh, unmute yourself and ask. I guess not. Uh, but if you would like to, you can also reach Brokoja and Albertoja through their email addresses, uh, or you could write in the chat. Um, thank you, Dan. Uh, I would like to proceed with our third speaker, uh, who will be um, Dr. Alfa Yozcan. Um, Alfa Yozcan will be talking about magnetic resonance as a central station merging various disciplines. Alfa Yozcan. All right, thank you very much. Let me. Um, it says, I guess the other screen sharing needs to be stopped. Um, I, I'm going to say yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I hope you can see the screen. Yes. 
Um, so basically today, I want to talk a little bit about the merger of disciplines via magnetic resonance. And although the subject is magnetic resonance, I'll start with showing uh, an example using a CT. Um, there are two things I, there are actually, on this slide, I want you to notice one thing that the CT scanner's gantry is tilted. Um, this is for the purpose of um, adjusting the image slice orientation. Uh, in this case, uh, the interventional radiologists, there are two of them, um, are trying to cryoablate a renal tumor. So for obtaining images, they need to tilt the gantry of the whole uh, CT scanner. The second thing I want you to notice, this, this is the screen, or the, these are the images that they are looking at. Um, and here they are trying to reach the tumor. But if you notice in terms of soft tissue contrast, there is, uh, there is a little bit of difficulty in comparison to MR, okay, it's a fast technique, but soft tissue contrast for the CT by definition is not as uh, powerful as MRs or MRIs. Um, so for being able to take advantage of MRs, these two properties, one of them, you don't need to tilt anything to obtain uh, oblique or uh, obliquely placed slices and high uh, soft tissue contrast. About 15 years ago, we developed uh, at Washington University in St. Louis uh, an MR-compatible robotic device. That would this is this is the this is like you can see it as a handmade device. This is a 1.5 Tesla human scanner. Uh, there are controllers. Uh, there are computers that are controlling the controllers of the robot, and everything is controlled from the uh, scanner room. The idea behind here is to adjust. As, first of all, as there is no, not enough room in the MR scanner's gantry, you need to be able to uh, insert the robot uh, and take the place of an operator's or a radiologist's hand. Um, right here, you see, if you wish, the first merger that I'm talking about computer science, I'm talking about robotics, uh, I'm talking about geometry, uh, virtual, a virtual environment. This is, by the way, graphical user interface that I built myself in 2005 with MATLAB. So already from one side, from the from an engineering point, math, applied math point, uh, things start to show up. What, what, what am I talking about when I say this soft tissue contrast? MR has the ability to tell us why, explain why physics or MR physics, uh, MR has the ability to tell us different tissue properties. One of them is that the one I'm showing here, Burakoja talked about the uh, tractography. Uh, here I'm showing a model, the so-called diffusion tensor imaging model um, that has been developed in, in mid nineties. But basically in addition to running some experiments, standard experiments, you add a couple of more magnetic fields in the MR scanner while running the MR scanner. Uh, I want you to notice two things. This is the image of a, a baboon brain, fixed baboon brain prepared by a friend of mine, again, at Washu. Um, I want you to notice two things. These diffusion gradients, these motion sensitizing gradients, when applied across the internal capsule, they create a decrease in an intensity. The reason for that is that uh, the molecules are moving along those fibers and that motion attenuates the signal. Same brain, same baboon brain, same fixed brain, you just change the orientation of the uh, motion sensitizing gradient, um, that contrast difference disappears. So in this example, I'm showing you that the MR scanner can tell you about microstructure of the, of the tissue. Um, however, the, the methods that have been proposed for obtaining these data are transferred or are adapted from uh, diffusion MR spectroscopy, which is a one-dimensional procedure. Um, and let's say they were not work enough uh, to improve the situation for diffusion tensor imaging. Okay, don't look, don't look at those equations in too deep, but this is, this is an objective function that I put in. This is basically telling us that while we are doing these scans, there are diffusion sensitizing gradients, okay, but there's also imaging gradients. 
And you cannot separate the effect of imaging gradients from the diffusion or motion sensitizing gradients. What I put over here, again, don't to look too deeply. Uh, don't look too deeply. What I put over here is to say that I want to change the, these diffusion gradients that I'm choosing uh, in a way such that the effect of imaging gradients on the motion is complete, not completely, but is minimized as, as much as possible. So you define a, an optimization problem, you solve it, and it gives you a better behaving, better data obtaining gradients. Here, another merger, if you wish, optimization theory, applied math system science uh, used for the MR. When you do that, okay, so these are, uh, this is a standard scheme uh, proposed by Jones a long time ago. Um, there are the, the so-called, at the, at, the, at the edge of the gray matter, there are the so-called U fibers. Okay, with the, uh, with the standard schemes, it is very difficult to see or notice these U fibers. However, if you put, if you use the optimized gradients, um, you, can, you can now start noticing the U fibers. So basically, uh, working with these uh, mathematical objects, you can obtain better results. Um, here is, by the way, when you do diffusion tensor imaging, you are basically working with a three by three symmetric matrix. Uh, the eigenvectors of which, or if you're not familiar with eigenvectors, basically you are working with, with a reference frame that defines uh, the most suitable direction for the molecules to move on. I, I, I want to draw your attention to this, to this area, which is also kind of dark, and notice that the red arrows are pointing in the same direction as the internal capsule, okay? So this is a larger area of, the, of that same baboon brain, but you can basically create tractography and obtain microstructure measures using that scheme, that differential, uh, that uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Um, and actually, about 20 years ago, as a big, big breakthrough, um, the, they, they imaged uh, neonates, uh, premature neonates, and they imaged the development of the, uh, or walking of the neurons via glial cells that was uh, projected by Ramon y Cajal maybe 100 years ago. And so this was, this was uh, published on the cover of that cerebral cortex journal as a demonstration of the developments within 10 years. Okay, something that has been seen in pathology has been transferred to magnetic resonance imaging, if you wish. So if you wish, from neuroscience to magnetic resonance imaging, another merger. Okay, so the, the, the problem there is that if you look, when I was working on these diffusion tensor imaging business, uh, I, I started to look a little bit more um, carefully, and it turns out actually that, that that model that came from spectroscopy has more to it in the sense that uh, instead of seeing the problem as three-dimensional uh, for imaging and a separate a set of separate three dimension for motion, um, I I developed or I worked through the uh, from scratch, and I said I'm basically saying that uh, there is no separation between the imaging part, the image part, and the motion part. So instead of working with just uh, two different spaces, you have a six dimensional large Fourier space. Okay, and I call this complete Fourier direct MRI this model. Okay, again, if you check this out, this is electrical engineering applied math um, um, and data interpretation, if, if you wish, physical modeling, another merger. Um, so if you walk through, if you, if you carefully carry out the steps of this six, six dimensional space and take an inverse free transform after careful manipulations, um, you will get better structure rather than these three, three vectors that I showed you. Um, you, can, you can get more complicated structures and in fact, at the intersection of corpus callosum and the internal capsule, um, you can see the crossing fibers. This could also give more information about the uh, structure of the, or health of the uh, white matter tissue. Again, computer science, uh, electrical engineering, applied math, another merger, okay? Physics, MR physics, um, very fundamental things. Um, even at the simplest level, if you run a couple of simulations with what, what people do uh, as a, 
as again a bad inheritance from the uh, spectroscopic apl applications or one dimensional applications, what people do is to use the absolute value of the signal. Um, it's, this is normal for clinicians uh, since they are looking at images uh, via their contrast. However, if you really want to do a proper modeling and you know, you should, you should and if you, if you do Fourier analysis, MR by the way is basically Fourier analysis, you need to use complex numbers. If you don't do that, without even putting a, a, a subject or a sample to the MR, if you run simple simulations, okay, like particle hitting a wall, particle hitting particle hitting a corner, okay, if you simulate uh, the MR uh, procedure as a Fourier transform uh, after taking the absolute value of the displacements in this case, um, you get a, you get symmetric values. Neither this nor this correspond to. You can't tell by looking at this picture that there's a there's a corner here. However, if you don't take the if you if you appropriate the process to data, you can you can basically tell by looking at the uh, distribution of the displacements that the um, there is a corner there. So another kind of merger of computer science, graphics, uh, applied math with MR. Speaking more about the oh by the way okay so what I want to emphasize over here is that. In my uh, model, I'm treating the um, MR signal as a complex variable, meaning that it has a magnitude and it has a phase. So it has a real part and imaginary part. But let's keep magnitude and phase in mind. Um, I don't want to cut, but uh, I'm sorry. You're all right, so there is another, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking so long. Okay. You can do the same thing with using the phase. You move this up to one level, you bring data together, and you, you bring up uh, data visualization methods. Uh, you put in some machine learning for breast cancer, just with the multimodal data. And you do the same thing for glioma brain images. So applied math comes in. And you also invent new methods for looking at the normally appearing white matter and some distribution analysis using uh, machine learning. And there you go. You merge different modalities or different sciences under MR. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so long. I didn't have a chance to check that. Thanks. I'm sorry, Ari, rushed you so much, but thank you for no your presentation. No uh, problem. OK, uh, next we'll be listening to um, Burçin Ünlü from the physics department. And uh, Burçin Hoca will be talking about physics and disease. Burçin Hoca, are you here? Yes, it's an Hoca. I am here. Uh, so can I start? Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I can start. Uh, perfect. Thanks for the invitation. Esen hocam. Bütün hocalarıma merhaba diyorum. Sizi görmek çok güzel. So, uh, so I have my timer with me. So I will try to present everything in 10 minutes. So just let me know if you have any questions, you can always email me. So we work on the imaging and physics of disease. Uh, so our main goal is to look into different diseases using the techniques that we developed. Uh, so these, this is my research group. These are all devices we developed uh, in the lab right now. So I will give you examples. Uh, some of them I will not talk. I'm not going to talk about proton therapy or radiation therapy studies we did. I am not going to talk about the machine learning studies we did. So all I'm going to talk today is the, the imaging systems we developed and examples from these uh, imaging systems. Uh, now we have capability of looking at exosomes uh, using Raman uh, tweezers and Raman spectroscopy system that we developed in the lab. Uh, so these exosomes are important in cancer uh, detection and cancer diagnosis. Uh, so these are small cargo carriers of the cellular mechanisms. Uh, so we are going to publish this very soon. Uh, in collaboration with Nesin Hoca uh, from biology department, molecular biology uh, genetics department and Utkan Demirci from Stanford. So what we do is um, 
we, dif- we look at different exosomes uh, coming from the different cancer types and try to characterize and differentiate them. So this, the main goal is liquid biopsy in future. Uh, so this is going to be important. So we have some nice results. So point one, we can look at uh, very small uh, biological structures using Raman spectroscopy and Raman tweezers. Uh, so another thing is, again, we can use Raman spectroscopy for ex vivo imaging as well as in vitro imaging. So this is a kind of uh, microplastic accumulation in the liver. We looked at and we published this data. Uh, another thing is this a blood disease. Uh, we were able to get data and looked at with Raman uh, teasers and Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so this is also published. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this either. And another one is aortic aneurysm by Raman uh, spectroscopy. This is, I think, got accepted somewhere. Uh, so uh, kind of we can do this kind of uh, imaging modality studies with in collaboration with the doctors. And we have a collaboration going on with uh, uh, some doctors from Akdeniz University, Gamze Ocha. So we are trying to do label-free breast cancer characterization by Raman spectroscopy. And uh, we have an acoustic microscopy system, which has a resolution of five micrometers. So we can do uh, uh, pathology basically without any staining. So this is what we are trying to do, pathology without staining. Another thing is we have some collaborators. We are trying to look at plants. Plants are very interesting uh, subjects for us, especially nitrogen. Um, so we can do Raman spectroscopy of uh, plants, leaves, basically. Very interesting results. Uh, another uh, imaging system we developed, we have now photoacoustic microscopy system. I think we are the only uh, group in Turkey which has uh, photoacoustic photo microscopy system that works. Uh, now a second one is coming with Alpan Senarolu in Koç University. They have a system right now. Uh, we worked on that for some time. So this is uh, what we do is in, in, instead of sending ultrasound uh, waves, we send laser light and get ultrasound images. So the contrast is optical contrast. So the contrast, the information content is much higher than the ultrasound and the depth resolution is compared to ultrasound. So this is the system we have, photoacoustic microscopy system. Uh, we can do pathology without staining, uh, ex vivo studies. Uh, so again, with Gamze Hoca from Akdeniz University, uh, these are pathology results, breast tumor sections. Uh, they send us, we look at them. And in vitro images, we, con- we can combine photoacoustic with the acoustic microscope system. Left-hand side is acoustic microscope system uh, that we have. Uh, I will tell you that with Funda Hoca uh, in Koch University, we are looking at nanoparticles, uh, which will be used as contrast agents uh, for photoacoustic uh, imaging at the same time phototermal therapy. Okay, uh, we, they developed nice called nanoparticles so this is the setup we have. Uh, Natalie uh, uh, is working on this setup. Uh, so she's not here, but, uh, okay. So interesting thing that I will show you, we can do cellular imaging. So what you see here is the, this, this is folic acid targeted nanoparticles developed by Fondoja. So we send them to cells, uh, cells. There is an uptake of these nanoparticles and we see them very clearly. Uh, this is a nice example of targeted imaging using photo, uh, uh, nanoparticles. These images are very nice. They are not optical images. These are acoustic images, okay? Not optical. Uh, I very, be very careful about it. These are not microscopy images, not optical microscopy images. So the interesting thing is uh, normal microscopy images, uh, you cannot see these things. So we can see this because of... Um, they absorb the light at some certain wavelength and they produce acoustic waves and acoustic waves, we can collect these acoustic waves and do uh, imaging, microscopic imaging. So clinical translation, 
Uh, we are working on that so solid imaging in small animals, ex vivo retina imaging, uh, lipid and collagen mapping in near infrared. Okay, and pathology and staging skin cancer. Staging skin cancer uh, is uh, kind of important. Uh, there's a literature on it. So uh, another important thing, uh, we have a recent uh, kind of big project uh, for prostate cancer. Uh, I will tell about it very shortly. Um, so we can develop our own lasers. This is important. We don't have to pay thousands of euros to fix them when they are broken. We can fix them ourselves. Uh, these are cheap uh, compared with solid state ones. And these are uh, these can be repaired when they are broken by us. So that's very important. We, we, we have we, uh, tunable wavelengths. Femtosecond lasers are very important for a lot of uh, microscopic imaging systems. It's very important. Uh, so this is the, we can do welding, okay? Welding, so we can kind of develop glass-based um, microchips. Um, uh, so these are examples. Uh, okay, so I will just continue. So welding is very important in microfluidic, opt, uh, microfluidics, optoelectronics and packaging. So Seydi Yavash is working on this project with students. Uh, another thing, uh, okay, so let's go. Okay, we can look at all these things later. Um, okay, so this is a very high power laser. At the same time, we can use it for microscopic systems. So this is 1003 project with Koch University, Tarık Esen and Uğur Selek. So we developed a catheter-based photoacoustic imaging system for prostate cancer. Detection part is totally fiber-based. So we got some very good results. Uh, so we are going to publish hopefully very soon after I'm done with the report. So we have a NATO project, explosive detection using photoacoustic spectroscopy. So um, this project is undergoing again. We, we got some good results. Um, and acknowledgement and thank you. So I'm done in nine minutes. Yes, well, thank you for being on time, Fortune Hocam, and thanks for this nice presentation. I would like to open the floor again for questions because I think Burçin Hoca has a class. Alpay Hocam, are you here? Uh, if so, uh, does the audience have any questions for Alpay Hoca and Burçin Hoca? If so, please unmute, unmute yourselves and uh, ask, or you could use the chat window. Everybody is rather quiet today. <laughs> Maybe I can ask this, Nojam. Yeah, please, Nojam, go ahead. Thank you for the nice talk, Gucci uh, Nojam. So uh, the part that you were explaining that you are doing your own lasers was the most exciting part for me. So as working with the light responsive nanoparticles, the lasers are very important that we could collaborate as well. So um, apart from that, um, I have a question regarding the uh, folic acid conjugated nanoparticles that you are collaborating with Fundoja. Um, yes. So I'm actually, so that's a very fascinating uh, molecules also to target cancer cells. So as uh, you also mentioned, um, but did you have any contribution on the imaging side? So yes, we, for example, when we, conjugate folic acids onto the nanoparticles, we check the cellular uptake and it, it enhances in the cancer itself. But did you try without folic acid also and image them? Did you compare yes. and would that have any contribution? Yes, uh, yes, Bano Hocam. We have all the results, but I, I have only 10 minutes, so I don't show Yeah, them. of course. But we can talk, we can talk, okay? So we can always talk. Yes, we did. Yeah. Natalie is the... Uh, uh, postdoctoral researcher, uh, and she's kind of doing all this work. Uh, so maybe you can visit us and we can talk all together. Uh, so, you know, that would be very nice. But yes, yeah. we are doing all those uh, yeah, imaging yeah, imaging studies. You are definitely yeah, right. So that's, that's very interesting, actually. So maybe uh, I can, uh, when you have time, I can uh, uh, see your lab as well. That would be very nice for me <laughs> as a me one of the new starters of the university. So in these hard times. That's the one big, 
<gülüyor> Her zaman bekleriz bana hocam. Sağ olun hocam. Okay. O zaman yazışırız sizinle belki daha detaylı tamam. konuşalım. Tabii ki. Teşekkürler. Thank you, Banu Hocam, uh, for this nice contribution. Are there any questions from the audience? Ben de fırsat varken aslında e, Burçin Hoca'ya, Alpay Hoca'ya ve Burak Hoca'ya, yani bizim enstitü zaten bu işleri hep yapıyoruz, e, katıldıkları için teşekkür etmek isterim. Çok değerli oldu. Tabii ki Albert Hoca'nın e, sunumu da ve bizim enstitüden birkaç konuşma daha olacak. Bu çok değerli oldu. Ayrıca konuşuyor olacağız zaten. Ben çok teşekkür ederim Can davet için. Isın hocam. Ee, çok teşekkür ederim. Ben de ben teşekkür de... ederim. Bu arada bir reklam gireyim. Akşam 18'de e, <gülüyor> e, gö- konuşma var. Berkin Belgiç Harvard'dan e, hocalarımızdan sorabilirsiniz linki Zoom. Herkese açık. Reklamı kapatıyorum. Teşekkürler. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> tamam faturayı yollayacağız şimdi reklam için. <gülüyor> Okay, so our next speaker will, will be Professor Dr. Ahmet Ademoğlu of DME. Uh, Ahmet Hoca will be talking about his laboratory on uh, neurosignal analysis. Ahmet Hoca, um, if you could share your screen, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry because my camera is sometimes on, sometimes off. It has a problem, so I'm not able to make it <coughs> working now. No problem. Uh, thank you for this organization and uh, thank you for the speakers. For the nice presentations. Uh, let me try to share my screen first. Okay, can you properly see my slides yes. now? Okay. Yeah, very briefly, I will try to describe the research agenda as well as the technical expertise of our laboratory uh, that we call neurosignal uh, analysis lab. Uh, basically, we are interested in neuroimaging as well as um, neurosignal uh, processing. Our fundamental research uh, concentration areas are EEG source reconstruction, fMRI data processing, EEG fMRI multimodal data integration, brain connectivity analysis, and brain computer interfacing. So when we talk about EEG source reconstruction, very briefly, what we can say is uh, the, source, the, the EEG data collected from the skull is transferred to the source, the source space on the, on the cortex, uh, which requires uh, several problems to be solved. One is the forward problem, and the other is the inverse problem. And in order to solve the forward problem, we use the structural MR images and make a geometric model of of the uh, brain, cerebral, spinal fluid, scalp and skull. And then we make a, a, a, a so we solve the uh, Maxwell's equations over this uh, geometric system. And then so that, so that we can relate uh, the sources to the uh, scalp distributions. But in fact, the problem is just the inverse because we are measuring what we are measuring with the scalp electrode data and then we, start, we try to go back to the uh, source space. And that requires some sort of optimization and regularization because it's a, a heavily imposed problem. Uh, one immediate application of this technique is in the clinic is uh, epileptic source localization. Uh, this was a study that we had carried out with uh, Jaya Pasha Medical School, the neurosurgeon, neurosurgery and uh, neurology department. Their regular routine is to use deep and as well as uh, patch electrodes on the cortical surface to I- I identify the location of the uh, epileptic focus before they plan the surgical treatment. And what, uh, what we were trying to do was actually to make a cross validation of scalp EEG data uh, with, the, um, with the deep electrodes as well as the, with the cortical electrode data to identify the uh, locations of of the um, uh, epileptic focus. And on the left, you can see, this is the deep electrode, uh, more realistic uh, um, distribution of the electrical charge during the uh, epileptic seizure. And this is what we have been able to find by using the scalp electrodes. And um, our uh, this, the maximum discrepancy at that time was like eight millimeters when we compared to 
deep electrodes with the scalp electrodes, which is not a bad thing. Of course, you can increase the number of electrodes on the surface. At that time, I believe it was like 30, 30 electrodes. But if you have, can increase the number of electrodes, then you can get a more accurate localization. Another area is just the uh, since we know that EEG is, is very good in time resolution, but it's relatively poor in frequency resolution, in, in, in, in spatial resolution. Uh, on the other hand, fMRI has a very good uh, spatial resolution within the order of millimeters, but it has a rather, uh, rather uh, low uh, uh, resolution in, uh, in time. So what we were trying to do was to use the multimodal imaging, which is essentially to uh, record the EEG and fMRI simultaneously, and then uh, and then use source localization and then map it to the cortical surface, in which we also have the fMRI data, so that we can spatially as well as temporally register these two modalities. Uh, and we do the HLF convolution on the EEG data because it is a much higher resolution signal and time domain just to match it into the hemodynamic response. And then do the regular GLM analysis and find out the uh, coefficient and map them on the surface so that these coefficients actually uh, express the brain regions in which both the EEG and fMRI are responding uh, in a significant way. And we were also using some uh, multi linear uh, regression methods uh, based on tensor decompositions and using the tensor, uh, different formulations of tensor decomposition can allow you to do different things like source localization or um, connectivity analysis and even uh, data fusion or multimodal imaging. So in a, in a multi-dimensional data, you can decompose it. It's just a, like the general version of this singular value decomposition. So you can formulate the problem. Let's say if you have an EEG data, you can make it. Uh, you can also apply a time frequency analysis by wavelets or, or by short time field transform and make it a three-dimensional system. And then you can decompose them into independent components, which we call spectral, temporal, and spatial signatures. And then uh, at the same time, if you just uh, take the spatial part and also constrain it with the uh, with the lead field matrix that we obtain from the uh, realistic head model for the source uh, localization, then you can solve this optimization problem and then uh, you can also find out the source distribution as well. Uh, and another thing is just to merge this uh, thing in, uh, to do multimodal imaging. So you, you, you have two sets of data. One is the EEG data and the other is the fMRI data. So you can maybe, sometimes you may want to, might, you might be interested in um, finding a common spatial pattern, which is expressed both in fMRI and EEG data. So then you can uh, do this uh, multi-dimensional, multi-model, multi-dimensional decomposition using coupled matrix tensor factorization. And then you can find some components, for instance, for this component, which is predominantly the alpha, alpha activity, which is the spectral component, is expressed in the spatial, as a spatial component, both in fMRI and EEG as a common uh, spatial pattern. Uh, and it also has an associated temporal pattern for both um, EEG and uh, uh, uh, bolt signal, which in which you can correlate with your um, stimulus signal. And also uh, you can do connectivity analysis using the tensor regression because if you use, especially the Granger causality, which is a multi uh, variate autoregressive modeling, uh, can be cast into a tensor regression problem. Uh, uh, which you can solve uh, some uh, specific tensor regression algorithms like Parafac uh, Granger causality algorithm or the T product uh, Granger causality algorithm. So, based on these equations, you can find out the uh, tensor versions of the uh, uh, normal equations and autocorrelation uh, functions, etc. And then you can find out these uh, connectivity structures based on these A matrices, which are the autoregressive coefficients. And finally, what I can say is that with all these techniques, we are trying to um, use these source localization, graph signal processing, and uh, optimization techniques to do some uh, brain-computer interfacing uh, in order to do motor 
motor imagery, emotion recognition, or epileptic seizure prediction. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Ahmet Hocam, for this nice presentation. Um, are there any questions for Ahmet Hocam? Um, you could always reach the speakers later uh, through their email addresses, or if you would like to write a question later, you could use the chat window. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, I will continue with our ne next speaker. Uh, Jenkson Öztürk. Jenkson Hoca will be talking about research at XLab, uh, democratization of medical imaging. I really like your slogan, Jenkson Hoca. So the floor is yours. Jenkson Hoca, you're on mute. I mean, since the slogan is democratization of medical, medical imaging, it is tough to talk, I guess. It was a long, long choice of title. Okay, let's start the presentation. Uh, essentially, a second title could be uh, Make Your Own Medical and Biomedical Imaging Devices. A new, a slightly different variation of the same title. I do, this is an overall introduction for future references for collaborative national and international projects, including the Neurotech EU. So I included a pers uh, short personal introduction ranging be, uh, from my medical degree to physiology and later in biomedical engineering. But my main research is essentially medical imaging, magnetic resonance imaging in the earlier days in transferred into image guided therapy application in the subsequent years. And then more and more, we are now designing innovative medical devices with this democratization principle, hopefully expanding that from medical imaging technology to other biomedical instrumentation. I had experience with this establishment of the Center for Life Sciences Technologies. And in recent years, for the last five years, I'm also coordinating a regional health tech industry cluster with various additional activi activities, which might be relevant for university industrial collaborative projects at the national scale, as well as with international counterparts, including the Neurotech EU. In, uh, in the earlier work, this intervention MRI suite is as, as similar to the work presented by Professor Alpay Özcan, on uh, the need for soft tissue guidance uh, for advanced interventional uh, procedures. Uh, in my work, including the uh, sequence development, as well as integrative registration and system design for this interoperative interventional MRI suites in the initial years, including additional development of uh, devices which require specific devices because of the magnetization properties of metals and as well as software side, visualization type and registration side. An example is shown here for a high contrast cardiac image beating heart and you have seen the catheters designed specifically purposes for reaching spe uh, specific locations within the heart for therapy deliveries. In later years, this expanded, uh, including uh, uh, image fusion research, which combines X-ray with MRI. Uh, then you can get more detailed, certain images from X-ray um, or from certain specific detailed in, uh, software contrast from the MRI and overlay it to the heart uh, and then guide the procedures there. And then this can be also routinely presented for live X-ray imaging where you also change the pan and tilt angle of the X-ray imaging or combining with various procedures. So you don't have the soft tissue in X-ray imaging, but you can still guide the procedures there. So this might be relevant in many, various applications also in neural side. Let me then come to Turkey and did a little bit medical imaging side, which is now a more comprehensive umbrella uh, laboratories, Bazıç University Medical Imaging Laboratories, 
many of you are a member of it now. In later years, this research track evolved into an X lab. And more, the initial projects was uh, developing a dental X-ray system, portable, fully digital, uh, CMOS based uh, digital acquisition. Everything was designed from with, uh, student thesis projects, uh, Tubitac projects, and it was put up to technology readiness level six, seven. Uh, we were able to get the full design implemented, images are acquired, and then we utilize it. We proposed it to industrial uh, counterpart, but never took off on that side, only stayed on the academic side. Uh, similarly, we uh, did uh, get all the components and uh, these years, maybe eight, nine years ago, put a digital X-ray system from all components there and then put it in our health clinic first, and then put it in a medical center and get it tested. This was not much, uh, I mean, innovative work, but more like engineering work and system design and putting things to, together. Then things got a little bit out of hand, I guess. Then we decided why not uh, have a dramatically different approach here for fast innovative device development, we can maybe have a specific approach on both hardware and software side, all the ways towards clinical application, just develop these platforms. So once you develop a specific system using this device, then you can move to another imaging device with the same principles and transfer the experience from one device project to the next one. Uh, this is the first uh, working prototype of a line-based X-ray scanning system that we employ these principles. Here you put the, uh, the person lays down and the imaging system uh, travels on top of it. It is essentially a, a, the same idea of like a paper scanner applied to an X-ray imaging system, high resolution, high contrast. Uh, capabilities, we got the images, get it operation. But the idea was that within that system, we had designed the central control device, which, com which controls all the components of uh, X-ray device, including the tube and imaging device, panel, moving components. And, the, uh, and, the, and this device is designed. And then most of the in components, additional components, let's say the tube can be replaced with ease. And then you can replace the panel at a later year. So it is essentially allows uh, innovative design project to spin out from the central uh, dedicated hardware control device, much easier than a dedicated system than the, where the threshold is high. This principle has been published, published and thesis works and several patents have been issued to this approach. Not only on, hard, on the hardware side, but on the imaging software side, uh, uh, we propose uh, with Altai's work is that uh, the software, why not develop an open source medical imaging clinical software? I mean, there are many uh, open source uh, software, of course, but can it be all the way pushed towards a valid clinical software? including all these medically relevant uh, properties, which has to be included in these. So in centralized imaging uh, core development system has been developed, uh, including again, with all the components of the visualization user interface and control of the hardware. So the hardware component of control box now also connects easily uh, and works in synergy with this open source approach. Uh, the, some of these hard visual settings are here. This has been also published on uh, in general terminology as also as a technical report, how this can be further accepted and utilized towards clinical software development. In the future, based on our technology, Further work needs to be done on diagnostic accuracy and the validation of the system uh, on, our, on the system that we developed. 
we, instead of uh, having a highly expensive and dedicated uh, line scanner, we like to start with simple, uh, shorter line scans and then integrate it together in a Lego, Lego style, essentially, and have a essentially scalable platform for line scanning. And this is, has been, initial work has been done as a master's thesis and future work is needed. Slowly, we are inching towards uh, looking at the panel itself. These X-ray panels are very expensive and in panel form, uh, that, uh, the, especially the coverage of this panel and utilization of, it, of similar panels in various applications, including the nuclear imaging applications, it has captured our attention. We are trying to move more and more uh, towards a panel research as well, complementing our previous activities on the imaging system, again, with the same idea of uh, democratization. So the democratization is essentially uh, developing a technology on a subject which is usually reserved for big players. So you develop platforms on software and hardware to make it accessible to wider range of uh, researchers and also startup companies. And the idea is to promote innovative design in tough to reach uh, places. So uh, I display the plug integrate play hardware components very briefly and the idea of an open software platform for clinical grade medical imaging there. For Neurotech EU, so uh, I guess this image guided interventions is our main focus and has my ex personal experience starting with MRI, XFM, X-ray fused with MRI and, and in essentially in any other modality that requires dedicated devices, image fusion and registration approaches, wherever there is might be some additional uh, need for novel imaging hardware solution, similar to the ones that are uh, presented by Virgin. And then this is our uh, link to our laboratory. Of course, the most important one are the students and researchers in that group. Some of them are uh, uh, uh, still going on with their research. Some of them have graduated and now have their own lab and new ones are coming on the main idea of a team of democratization and making research accessible in tough to reach areas on medical imaging in terms of hardware. And hopefully we will move to additional medical instrumentation projects in the, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you for this great talk, Jeng Sonojan. Um, are there any questions for Jeng Sonojan? Any specific uh, comment? Well, I'm glad that he explained what he means with democratization, because it could have been <laughs> very dangerous. But now I know that we are safe. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I have one question, Jeng Sonojan. You said sure. that your product was up to uh, year of six to seven which is a great achievement and then what stopped you going further like what was the block dash i mean uh, you have to have certain uh, investment and commercial uh, motivation to move it beyond that initially when we started the project on both dental x-ray and later on regular clinical x-ray there was a great wave of digitization and transformation of our current analog-based X-ray imaging systems in the country. So uh, our students who started their academic, academic work eventually want to pursue, uh, uh, the, uh, pursue this commercial uh, track as well. Not personally myself, but we were thinking supporting this approach in the future. But uh, the way things are developed is the transformation is going on so rapid. You cannot catch up. You have to have certain investment and uh, a team of a separate group has to go on, on that track very strongly. In, in terms of digital imaging, then the big national companies entered that market. And there was a talk of a uh, transforming the development of a national X-ray imaging system by that uh, 
big uh, national industrial company. So then there is not much room left for a small SME or an academic startup, but we are currently collaborating with those companies, one or two, that are pursuing this at the national scale, and we are uh, providing our know-how to them. Then, uh, whatever we have developed uh, has been made uh, available to those national uh, projects as well. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, I think that's the main uh, missing link, you know, uh, maybe a better uh, collaborative environment and more supportive grants for such in, uh, industrialization. Um, okay, last speaker is me. Actually, I would like to talk about our research activities at the Computational Imaging Laboratory. Uh, let me share my screen and then um, hopefully I'll also be on time. I'll take a look at... Uh, Okay, currently it's 19 past hour. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, at the Computational Imaging Laboratory, uh, we have 11 PhD students currently and uh, two master's students. Nine of the students are female and four of them are male. I would like to emphasize this fact because uh, basically, you know, we have to increase uh, the women presence in STEM and I think our lab is a good example of that. Uh, our lab was founded in January 2016 and we are going strong. Um, our research studies have focused on brain diseases, especially Parkinson's disease and brain tumors. And our goal is to help with diagnosis, treatment planning and follow up. Uh, as a methodology, we use machine and deep learning techniques, optimization, neuroimaging, uh, MR pulse sequence development and radiomics. And as an outcome, we hope to develop software for uh, data acquisition and processing and signal and image analysis. And we have been working on clinical decision support software. Our GitHub and lab websites uh, can be reached through these QR codes. Um, you can also look for Boston University Computational Imaging Laboratory and you could find us. Uh, I would like to talk about a couple of projects today. Our first project was a collaboration with Istanbul University, and uh, it was entitled Determination of Multimodality MRI-based Biomarkers for Mild Cognitive Impairment in Parkinson's Disease. And our aim was to develop biomarkers that would actually tell us about the presence of MCI at an early stage and predict its possible evolution into dementia. Uh, why is this important? Because MCI is present in like 27% of uh, PD patients and it doesn't really interfere with activities of daily living, but it's a risk factor actually for developing into dementia. And if we could diagnose MCI early, we might help with patient stratification for slowing progression. Uh, currently, uh, doctors use neuropsychological tests and they are not very objective and there's a need for defining objective biomarkers of MCI. To be able to do this study, we acquired uh, MRI data, and this is a, an example of our data set. We acquired anatomical MRI, diffusion-weighted MRI, uh, cerebral blood flow imaging, and then resting state fMRI, and spectroscopic data. And then we used machine learning and deep learning, not deep, just machine learning techniques. Uh, a couple of our results came out. Uh, so we have identified hypoperfusion and metabolic changes at especially the posterior cortical regions. And we have also developed a software called Oryx MRSI as a part of this project. It's a fully automated open source software. Uh, it helps with 3D proton MRSI data analysis and it is available on our lab uh, GitHub site. Um, our next project was on preoperative prediction of genetic mutations of diffuse gliomas based on MRI at 3 Tesla. This was a TÜBİTAK 2003 grant in collaboration with Acıbadem and Mehmet Ali Aydınlar University. And we acquired MRI data and we used machine learning to preoperatively predict some genetic mutations in gliomas. Um, IDH and HERT are two mutations that we worked on. These are important because they affect the overall survival. Um, so IDH mutant gliomas have a better response overall, whereas third-only mutant gliomas have the worst overall survival. So we try to identify these specific markers in these patients. 
As a result of our studies, so far we have identified patients with IDH mutation and teratoma mutation with over 90% accuracy. And we have developed an open source tool called Iris MRS AI. It's a clinical decision support tool that has machine learning models embedded, and it also has advanced uh, user interface for you know developing your own models. It has graphical uh, display uh, components, and it, it helps you process proton MRS and um, mass spectrometry data. Um, our next project was on advanced MRI and machine learning based product development for non-invasive detection of genetic subgroups of brain membrane tumors. This is another TÜBİTAK grant in collaboration with Acıbadem and Mehmet Ali Aydınlar University and Boğaziçi University Electrics and um, Electronics Engineering Department. Um, we acquired MRI data again and this time we used deep learning methods to preoperatively predict NF2 mutations in meningiomas. So why did we do this study? Uh, meningioma is the most common primary intracranial tumor in adults, and there is an NF2 uh, mutation or loss of NF2 function in meningiomas has been associated with a more aggressive tumor biology, and these patients have shorter time to recurrence and shorter overall survival. Uh, there is also S100 protein expression, which is a marker for neural crest drive meningiomas, and meningiomas having this expression have a tendency for a lower grade. So our aim was to preoperatively identify this NF2 loss and S100 protein expression in these patients. This study is ongoing, and so far uh, we have just actually last week written some ISMRM 2022 abstracts, and these are a couple of our results. Um, Esra used radiomics to identify NF2 loss, and she achieved 80% uh, accuracy. Abdullah used uh, T2 weighted MRI and then used deep learning techniques to identify S100 expression with uh, over 80% accuracy again on the test set. Uh, on the other hand, Banu worked on proton MRS data, and then she used the 1D CNN model and identified NF2 loss with almost 90% accuracy. And Sena worked on S. Uh, 100 expression uh, on the SWI images and achieved 85% accuracy. Um, we also collaborated with uh, Professor Dr. Korkut Yen of Ege University. Uh, he had a PhD student, Vishra Kahraman Ağır, and together we designed a bilateral variable elast elastic conductive textile breast coil. Uh, in short, we called it VCAT. Uh, so C shows our two-channel bilateral uh, breast coil that was worn on the small, medium, and large phantoms that Bushra designed. And G shows the um, same phantoms, but this time we developed a four-channel uh, breast coil that was wearable. Uh, we got a Turkish patent for this, actually, uh, product, but I forgot to put the link. Uh, and the international patent application is ongoing. We also developed a software as a part of this project called Breast IS, uh, which was a software uh, that was developed for MRI uh, visualization and analysis of the brain, uh, breast data. Um, it was capable of analyzing DC MRI, diffusion weighted MRI, proton MRSI, and it also had modules for image quality analysis and filtering. This was Bashat's work. Um, I think I have a few more minutes to talk about our last project on feasibility study of obtaining high-resolution spectroscopy images, uh, images using data fusion techniques in collaboration with University of Edinburgh. And as a part of this project, um, we developed super-resolution CNN techniques. Um, this is an example of a T1-weighted MRI. On the left, uh, you see the low-resolution and high-resolution images, and the result now and you apply it by cubic interpolation versus super resolution CNN. And also, we apply the same idea to NAA maps obtained from MR spectroscopic imaging. Uh, in comparison to the low resolution image, super resolution CNN showed the anatomy details better. And Austin worked on end to end deep shallow network structure for increasing the resolution of uh, diffusion weighted MRI. This is another super resolution technique. It has a deep and a shallow network structure. And on the left is a low resolution image, and on the right is the uh, gold standard, and in the middle is the predicted uh, super resolution image, which quite nicely depicted the anatomy. Uh, I would like to thank all our collaborators, and I'm sorry if I forgot anybody. Uh, so, 
here is again our GitHub and web website links. Um, so just let us know if you might have any questions. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. It's not um, this super resolution imaging. I mean, you, do you get something for nothing? Or is there any limit of that? I mean, can I acquire just a low, Im low resolution image and get the super resolution? So yeah, what, what, is, what, what is actually, what is go what actually going on there? Uh, that's the idea. Actually, you could acquire a low resolution image and then you could train a deep learning model to uh, generate a super resolved version. That is the main idea behind any of these deep learning techniques nowadays. You just train the system so that it learns from uh, a given you know, input and then learns to produce an output. Once you have a trained system, hopefully you could give it a low resolution image and it could generate a super resolved image. Well, um, you know, uh, there are so many ongoing studies. Uh, this is a new concept of the last five years or so. We are hoping that uh, actually it's gonna evolve to something better than what we currently have. Um, this concludes actually our talks. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. If you might have any questions for any of our uh, speakers, please go ahead. Esin Hocam, I have a um, suggestion because Pınar Özbay is with us. Yes. Maybe we can invite her to say a few words too, if, if she would find it appropriate. Okay, uh, Pınar Hocam, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, great. It's great to see you. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for the nice invitation also. I think it was, yeah, I feel lucky that I had a chance to listen to various labs from Boaz University, indeed. And uh, I, I guess I can say I hope to join soon. <laughs> and um, I think I will have a chance to contribute to the field in various aspects, both from MR side, imaging side, multi-model imaging. And um, meanwhile, I also applied for the um, grant from to be stuck. And uh, I guess we'll hear back soon in a month or so, if that works. Um, I hope to get a MR compatible EEG device and also eye camera if they confirm and if the budget allows, of course. But, <laughs> And um, with all those, I think um, I can help and contribute to various projects in Neurotech EU. And um, yeah, I think. Have you noticed that uh, the foreign currency, democratization of foreign currency has been really achieved? Yes. <laughs> I mean, from yesterday night on, there is 1.20 liras increase in Euro, for example. Yes, I'm close to following. <laughs> right. I follow Euro because my guitar equipment is usually in Euros. Some of, yeah, us I, trying, yeah. some of us are trying to purchase equipment with grant money, yeah, which were yeah. like quoted on uh, beginning of October and the quotes become invalid very quickly, very quickly. So I had a discussion today with uh, someone uh, from Aselsan and they, they, she told me that they also quitted that already. You know, Tubitag is a merger, you know, like Alpayoja merging techniques. So that's great. But otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> you know, purchasing device with foreign currency is impossible. But we can always get U uh, European grants and maybe utilize uh, capabilities of Neurotech EU for that. So we're working hard on that. So uh, I hope that may happen. Maybe we should stop uh, the official streaming component of this lecture That's and maybe we'll have, uh, we, we, I'm sure if people are usual or seminar time is uh, right, yeah. still going on. So maybe we can discuss a little bit further.